Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to my code review for the Automated Essentia Refilling Program. Uh, this is basically a program I wrote in ComputerCraft. It uses a computer, a touchscreen monitor, and a turtle to automatically refill the Essentia jars for Thomcraft and Fusion Crafting. It's a pretty neat system. I'm pretty pleased with the way it turned out. And uh, right now we're going to get started just diving into the code to see how it works. So this is uh, all about the code, how it works, how the code is programmed, and then I'll put a paste spin up. The paste spin will be in the description of the video so you guys can download the code and use it in your worlds as well. Um, so if you guys aren't interested in the code, then this probably isn't the video for you but if you are interested in how this all works then let's take a look so uh, without any further ado let's take a look at all the uh, the two main programs here that are responsible for controlling the system all right, so step one is uh, this computer program right here. And you can see um, that this is the one that controls the monitor. And it's also the computer that controls the Essentia jars. And we know that if we uh, take a real quick peek outside, we'll see that we've got a modem, a wired modem, connected with some networking cable, all connected into peripheral proxies, which are part of, as you can see, according to Wella, open peripheral add-ons. So basically what uh, these do is they allow you to um, connect to these jars as a peripheral. You using the wired modems. Wired modems can only connect to solid blocks and jars are not solid blocks, but jars are a valid form of peripheral. Like you can connect to like a chest, you can connect to jars and other kinds of stuff using um, open peripherals, but um, wired modems can't connect to those. So you have to use the peripheral proxy to allow them to connect, okay? So this computer right here is connected to all the jars around the Thomcraft room. Okay, so that's the main uh, component of that. That's going to read the aspects in the jars and display the information on the screen. The second piece of this program is right over here. Um, this is the turtle which is responsible for refilling the jars, okay? And his main job is to uh, have a chest below him with a bunch of mana beans in it. And these mana beans, there's one for each aspect all available. And I have a mana bean farm set up, constantly uh, feeding this thing. So you can see we've got lots and lots of mana beans, keeping ourselves uh, nice and full. All right, um, and we're doing that behind the scenes. You can kind of pump mana beans into this chest however you want. I'm doing it with uh, some stuff back here. We can see. Uh, we're using the transvector interfaces and some translocators. So the turtle's job here is to read the different aspects on all the different mana beans and then know which inventory slot each mana beans aspect is. So it knows that Luckrum is in slot one and Volatus is in slot two. Once it has all that information, it's able to, um, it's sitting right below the alchemical furnace where the mana beans get placed. So whenever you want to, uh, you know, run this, it'll say, hey, I need some Luckrum. So it'll go and know that Luckrum's in slot one. It'll grab the number specified and throw it into the furnace. So we're going to walk through uh, each of the two different pieces of code right now. So let's start with the turtle because his is probably about a little bit more basic. All right, like most programs, I kind of throw most of my variables up at the top. So first we open up the red net on the right. So that's a wireless modem so that it can receive signals from the uh, monitor computer. We've also got peripherals. We're wrapping C, which is the chest, to uh, below the turtle. We're wrapping A, which is the aspectalizer, a block from um, Thaumic Tinker, which is in front of the turtle. And then uh, F, the furnace, which is on the top above the turtle. Okay, and the redstone direction is the back. That's where we're um, sending a redstone signal. And that's this little redstone cabling right here, which disables um, the translocators in the back. That's kind of optional, like you can do it if you want. I just thought it was fun to add. And then uh, the main part of this is a variable, which is an array uh, named beans. Okay, and this is the array that stores which aspects are on which bean on which slot in the inventory below. So the main thing we have to look at here is uh, the code. So uh, first thing we do when the computer starts up is run the function called scan slots. Okay, and what scan slots does is if we come up here and find the scan slots function, we'll see that it um, sets the output of redstone um, in that redstone direction variable, which is the back, to true. That enables a redstone signal back here, which disables all the translocators. This prevents new beans from being added to the chest anytime uh, the redstone signal is applied. So because we're going to be pulling beans out of this chest, we don't want them to refill because we want to keep a full stack of each bean type in there. Okay, so that turns on the redstone. And then it goes for 1 to 55. Now there's 
like 51 or 52, I forget exactly how many mana bean slots or different types of uh, aspects there are. So it does go a little bit beyond it. It has like three or four slots it goes further than. And it just says, hey, if there's an item in that stock, in that slot, okay? So it starts with slot one and it says, if there's something in that slot, then scan the mana bean in that slot. That's all it has to do, okay? So it checks for an item in slot one and then it scans it. Then it checks for an item in slot two and then it scans it. And it keeps going all the way up in the for loop. So one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 55. And then it's done and then it turns off the redstone in the back. So what does the scan slot function do? Well, let's take a look. Scan slot is pretty easy. It just says given a slot number, so whatever slot you want to scan, so you know, inventory slot one, inventory slot two, inventory slot three, whichever, um, it goes to the chest, which is the peripheral there, and it pushes that item into the inventory above it. Um, and it grabs the item from the slot specified and it pushes it into the inventory slot number one. So it says, hey, you, mana bean, you're getting pushed up into the turtle because you're in slot one into the turtle's slot one. And then the turtle drops that item, which puts it into the inventory in front of it, which is the aspectalizer. Now the aspectalizer is a neat little um, block from Thaumic Tinkerer, which can uh, send computer information to um, the turtle. You can wrap it as a peripheral and it'll tell you which aspects are on the item and how many. So in this case, we know that every mana bean is going to have just one. So all we really care about is which aspects are on there. So it uh, creates a variable called data, which is, uh, I think it actually comes back as a string and it does um, that aspectalizer. It runs the function get aspects and it stores the aspect in that variable data. Then it takes the beans variable, which is an array, and it says, hey, beans data, okay? So the uh, name of the aspect is the um, index of the array, and then the slot that the uh, came in from the program here earlier is what the data in the array is, okay? So what that basically does is we have an array. So let's say an array, let's say we've got like four items in the array. So I picked four random things. So let's say Luckrum, right? It knows that Luckrum is in slot one. So the array um, index for Luckrum, it says you're in slot one. The array for Modus, if that was in slot two, let's say. Uh, Air, maybe that's in slot 16 in the inventory. And then Saxum is maybe in inventory slot 32, right? So any inventory slot it knows. So when we wanna go look it up, we say, hey, which slot is modus in it just looks at the variable uh, beans and says oh that's in slot number two so that's when you want to go grab from and air it looks for it says oh that's in slot number 16 so it goes and grabs it so that's it storing the uh, beans data so uh, luckrum is in slot one slot one okay pretty cool uh, then it sucks the item out of the inventory in front of it so it pulls that bean out of it and uh, it goes into uh, the chest and it says, hey, pull that item, uh, hey chest, pull the item from the inventory above you, uh, pull one of the items out of slot one into the slot that we specified earlier. So that just puts it and makes sure that the bean goes back into the original uh, inventory slot that it was in earlier, okay? So now we've been able to, by looping through all 55 inventory slots and checking for each one, we can say exactly which mana bean is in which inventory position in the chest below. Now that scan slots is complete, the only thing we do now is wait for a red net signal. So we go to the await red net function. And what that's going to do is it's going to get um, a message from the computer. Now the computer sends two pieces of information in this message. Um, and we I called it Essentia data. And it basically is um, which aspect to put in and how many we want. So if we want 20 Luckrum, then it knows I need Luckrum and I want 20 of them. That's all the information that's being sent, okay? So what it does here is it prints out that information just so I see it on the screen. This was more for debug code. It's totally not necessary. And then it runs a function called Essentia, um, which is up here. And Essentia is uh, receiving which aspect and how many we want. So what it does is, um, you know, it checks this. If not, um, the furnace get stack in slot one. So it checks first to make sure the furnace is empty. If there's something else in the furnace, it's not gonna run. So we've gotta make sure that there's something in the furnace first. And then it um, you know, goes into the chest and it pushes an item into slot. Okay, so it says, hey chest, push this item up. Which item do we want? Well, we will look at that beans thing and we say, hey, if we needed Luckrum, then go to the beans variable and look up which inventory slot Luckrum is in. And in this case, it would return slot one. So it'll push that up. 
How many do we want to push? The number that we asked for, so number of aspects. That's the other piece of information that came into this function. And then finally, which inventory slot do we want to push it to on the turtle? Inventory slot one, so it lands right here. Okay, uh, next we uh, do a redstone um, set output left true, sleeps for a second, uh, redstone set output left false, so it just does a quick redstone pulse uh, uh, to the left of this thing. And what that does is it activates this um, item duct right here to pull the items out of the turtle, and the items then land in a hopper that's above this item duct. Okay, um, and then it waits for about three seconds. Okay, and what it does is after those three seconds, it says, all right, I've, you know, pushed my aspects up there. And then we say, um, we're going to keep checking for a stack in the slot above it. So it says, hey, is there anything in that furnace? Um, and if there is, uh, it'll finish. But if, um, you know, if, if there is an item in it, it'll say waiting for empty furnace. It'll wait three seconds and it'll check again. So it'll keep checking for an item in the uh, furnace above. And then when it's done, it says, all right, I'm all set. And the await rednet signal then sends a um, message to the computer back there that says, I'm complete. So I pushed as many mana beans as you wanted to into the chest, into the furnace. So that's pretty much all this thing does. So when we restart this guy, what he's going to do is he's going to start scanning the mana beans. And you can see it right here. So it's pulling a mana bean out of each slot in order. And it's placing them in the Aspectalizer, and it's scanning them, and it's determining which mana bean is in which slot, just like I said it would earlier. Once it's done all that, it's ready to receive its redstone signal or its rednet signal command from the master computer. So let's go look at that code right now. So here's the Aspects screen, all right? So this is the uh, computer that controls the monitor, the touchscreen monitor, and all the aspects along uh, the wall here. So what we can do is, uh, there's a couple variables we define up front. We also uh, open a rednet so we can see the modem opening up on the left so it can communicate with the turtle. It loads the button API, which you guys have seen me use many times in the past. It's kind of like a little dumpy, stinky API that I wrote that's not really that good, but it does what I need it to do. And then uh, some basic variables. The ID of the turtle. So that computer, the turtle over there that's doing the moving, we need to know what the ID number is. So if you guys do download this code, that's one of the things you're going to need to change is the ID number of the turtle, because your turtle's ID will almost certainly be different. And uh, to find out the ID, you just type ID, and it tells you the, the ID of the computer you're working with. So just check the ID on the turtle that you put down, and then uh, change that in the code right there. Um, the uh, a, a variable called Essentia, that's another array that stores the amount of Essentia for each type. And then um, local jars is uh, peripheral.getNames. And basically what that does is it's getting all the peripherals that are attached to this guy. So it just says, hey, any peripheral that's attached to me, and it's all the jars, but this also includes things like the monitor, any other computer, any other peripherals you might have attached. So keep that in mind. Um, we've also uh, wrapped the peripheral on the top for the monitor. Um, a function called monitor coordinates, that's just an array that we'll use later. Current essentia is just a string that we'll use later. Fill amount is zero, and then rows active equals true. I'll show you what that means in a minute. So let's go past all of our functions that are written here and jump into exactly how this thing works. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is um, call a function called fill table. Okay. And what that is um, is creating a thing up here. It sets that variable rows active true. That's basically telling the program you're going to look like this. You're not going to have buttons all over the screen. You're going to have actual rows of data that we're going to find. Okay. And it also adds a button for uh, or it clears the whole screen end all the table, and then it just adds this one little button called refresh right down here. So that's all this is doing, is it's adding this button for refresh. And it specifies where on the screen to put that refresh button. And then uh, it fills the button on the screen. So at this point, the only thing shown on the screen is the refresh button. There's no data there yet. The next thing we do is called the refresh function, which is going to be up here. Okay, now what refresh does is it pretends the person clicked refresh and it just flashes it, but this is also what happens when you click the refresh button. And what it does is it clears the whole monitor, and then it runs the scan essentia function, then it runs the print essentia function, then it prints to the screen on the computer itself that we did the refresh, and then it refreshes the buttons on the screen, which just puts this refresh button back because we cleared it earlier. So let's first look at scan essentia. 
So remember that jars variable earlier that we created that checks for all the different um, aspects or all the different uh, peripherals that are hooked up to this computer? All right, what it does is for all of them, so it goes through um, all the pairs of jars and it says if the type of peripheral is tt underscore aspect container, which is like a behind the scenes little code thing that says you're an aspect jar or an aspect container of some kind. So if you're a monitor, don't do this stuff. If you're anything else but an aspect container, don't do this stuff. But if you are an aspect container, then do the following. It um, gets the aspect in there by calling that get aspects function, which is very similar to the way we used get aspects earlier. So it says what kind of aspect are, uh, is in you. So for example, this one over uh, here, it would say I'm iter. Okay. And then it creates a variable called count aspect, which says, hey, um, I know that you're iter, so you know, given the fact that you are iter, um, for that peripheral, j, which is a, just a little variable, it says get aspect count, and then the name of um, the aspect, which is iter, which we got you know, a few seconds ago. So it says, how much iter are in, is in you right now? And then the jar returns and says, I have 37. Okay, and then um, if it's greater than zero, so if there's more than you know zero essentia in there, then what it'll do is it'll store it in the um, variable essentia. It'll say um, that aspect has this much iter. And I'm using math.floor because it returns something like 64.0 or 37.0. So I wanted to make sure it stores it as just 37, not 37.0. So the way this thing would look is as follows, this array that we have. So it would first say, what kind of aspect are you? It would say iter. So that's the index of the array. And then the data in the array is how much iter there is. So I know that currently there's 37 iter. And now for the print essentia function, which is basically going to print all the essentia it finds. So first it goes through all the jars that it finds in there and it says, what kind of essentia is in you and how much? And it stores that all into a big array. Okay. Now it's going to uh, set the text color to white and it's going to set the XY coordinates to one comma one, which is the top left of the screen all the way up there. Okay. And what it does is say, um, you know, monitor coordinate X. So the coordinate X, which is currently one, is a new array and it's an empty array. And then it goes through all the different um, essentia types that's in that variable called essentia. Um, and it first sorts them using a sort function, which I'll show you in a little bit, but that's just to make sure that it sorts them by name. And it says if the amount of essentia inside there, so i comma j, this is i is now the name of the essentia and j is the amount there is. Okay, because this is the index and this is the data inside the array of Essentia. So if the amount of Essentia in this type is less than 20, set the text color to red. So you can see anything is less than um, or equal to 20, the color is red. Okay, um, if it's less than 40 but greater than 20, it's going to be yellow, and greater than or equal to 40 is green. So this is the way we set the color of the different things. Okay, so it's going to go through each of the Essentia types in that array. It's going to set the cursor position to x comma y. So the first time it goes through, it's x and y is 1. So it's the very top left slot there, and it should be doing air. And it'll write i, which is the index of the array, otherwise known as the name of the Essentia. So it just writes the word air. Next up, it sets the cursor position to x plus 14 comma y. So it just moves the x coordinate over 14 slots, which is going to be right here. So that it's always the same column regardless of how long the word is. And it does a write to string j. So it converts that uh, integer j to a string and prints it out on the screen. So in the case of air, it writes 55 because we've got 55 air aspects. Okay. And then um, we store in that monitor coordinate array, the xy position is going to equal the letter i, which is the index of the array or the aspect name. And I'll come back to where that monitor coordinate is later. But basically what it's saying is um, the monitor coordinates at x comma y, so this entire row here, is air. And it's storing that for monitor coordinates later so that when I right click on air, it knows which aspect is on that xy line. So when I click on it, it says, where did you click? Oh, you clicked on air. So that's a variable that I'm storing that in. It checks if y is less than 17. Um, if it is less than 17, so if it's anything between 1 and 16, it'll uh, simply add 1 to y. Otherwise, um, it'll set y to 1. So once it gets to 17 here, 
it'll add one to y, or it'll set y back to one, so it'll bring it all the way up to the top, and then it'll take x and add 17 to it. So it'll put the x cursor position up here, and then it'll start a new column. And then when it gets down to y17 again, it sets y back to one and adds 17 to x. Cool? And then uh, monitor coordinate, it creates a new monitor coordinate set for x. So at this point, we've scanned all the jars, we've figured out what essentially and what numbers of essentially they are in there, and we've printed them all out to the screen. We've also stored in an array um, which x, y coordinates each word is on the screen so that it knows when you click on it which one you clicked on. Now all we have to do is wait for a click on the screen, which is pretty simple. It's a function up here called getClick. And first thing it checks is what X, Y position you clicked on the screen. It also confirms that it was a monitor touch because an event could be me clicking a button on the keyboard or it could be any number of things. It could be receiving a redstone signal. So first we want to make sure that I actually clicked on a monitor and that's the event that we detected. And if that's the case, um, then we check to see if we clicked on a button first. So using that button API, we say check X, Y. Um, and if it is a button click that we did, like the refresh button, then it's going to go ahead and um, print the word button on the screen and do some stuff. Otherwise, um, it checks to see if the rows are currently active. So it makes to sure that, remember that rows active command we ran earlier? It checks to make sure that there's actually rows of words on the screen here. And if that's true, um, then it um, knows that I want to fill a certain aspect. So it's saying, hey, you probably clicked on a word and you want to fill something. So I'm going to create, a, or I'm going to set that variable earlier, fill amount equal to zero. So I'm going to assume right now you're filling it up by a zero number. And we're going to print on the uh, computer monitor here the coordinates that I clicked. It's just some more debug code. Anytime I print stuff to the computer right here, you can assume that it's just kind of me knowing that I clicked things and it's a little bit of testing. All right. So the other thing we grab is the current essentially that we clicked on. So remember that monitor coordinates array? So what it does is it checks for x minus x mod 17 plus 1 comma y. So what that's doing is it's saying, hey, I want to make sure that, um, you know, somewhere along this x coordinate, somewhere between 1 and 17, um, are we getting that click. And then the y coordinate. So that way... I can click anywhere on this line. If I didn't have that, if I just had X, I would have to click on the first letter. If I clicked on the second letter, it wouldn't work and anywhere else on the line. So by doing this little funky math thing here, it's making sure that I actually clicked on the entire line. It works anywhere. And then finally, I want to make sure that I actually clicked somewhere appropriately. So it checks current essentia is not nil. So like maybe if I clicked like right here, that's not a button and it's also not a word. So you want to make sure that that doesn't happen because without this line here, it might crash the program. So I just a little extra safe thing to make sure it doesn't crash easily. And it says um, if the um, Essentia um, variable, so remember we're storing it by name. So current Essentia that we picked, we want to see how much Essentia is in this jar. So how much Essentia is in the one you just clicked on? If it's less than 64, then we're going to be filling it up. Otherwise, we want to clear the screen and print out the following that that thing is already full, please choose another. So if I were to go and say, hey, I want to refill Alienus, well, it's going to tell me it's already full, so I can't add anything to it. So again, it's just a little extra feature, a little optional, but it's pretty cool. So let's go see what happens when we actually click on an Essentia that needs to be filled up some. So while we're going to be adding Essentia to this, we want to set that rows active thing to false because we want to make sure that um, you know when we have buttons on the screen, it knows that we're not clicking on some of the words, but we're actually clicking on uh, buttons. So what we do is we uh, clear the table, that's part of the button um, API, and we clear the monitor so that it's a completely blank monitor. Then we're going to print out the type of Essentia that we're currently working on, and we're going to tell you how much is currently in there. And then we're going to add some buttons, plus 1, plus 5, plus 10, minus 1, minus 5, minus 10. We're also going to add a refill jar button. Um, and what this is going to do is each of these are going to call the add essentia function. And uh, the information that we're going to pass is 1, 5, 10, negative 1, negative 5, negative 10. But the refill jar one is basically going to do uh, 64 minus the current amount of essentia in the jar. So it's going to say, you know, um, you know, take 64 minus current essentia. So if you have 55 and you click refill, it's going to know 64 minus 55 is equal to 9. So it's going to, um, you know, go ahead and say, I need you to add 9 to this. Okay. Um, finally, uh, we have an execute fill request, which is going to call the fill essentia command or function. We have a cancel button and then just a label at the bottom that says how much we're currently adding and what that is. Fill amount 
and the amount of or the type of essentia that we're adding to. Okay, so let's look at add essentia, fill essentia, and cancel. Add essentia is real easy. Remember that variable fill amount? That's how much we're currently trying to fill to. Well, we take what it is and add the number. So if we clicked plus one and it's currently zero, it'll be zero plus one, and now fill amount is one. If we click plus five now, it'll go from one plus five is six. If we do minus one, it'll go from six to five. Uh, but one other thing it does is it checks if it's less than zero, then it sets it to zero. Because, you know, it would be silly to say like, you know, 2 minus 5, we won't want it to go down to negative 3, because that wouldn't make any sense at all. It doesn't work that way, right? We can't pull essentially out of these jars the way we have it set up. So we're going to leave it and just say 0 is the slowest number it can possibly go. And finally, um, it checks if the fill amount is greater than 64 minus the current amount of essentia in the jar. And if that's the case, then we're going to set the fill amount equal to 64 minus the current essentia in the jar. So for air, you know, if we hit plus 10, it would go up to 65 and it'll say, hey, 65 is, you know, too much. So I'm going to bring you back down to 64. So we're going to change that uh, 10 to a 9. Um, and then it clears the screen and runs that fill table 2 command again. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to re-clear the screen and just, uh, you know, show the current fill amount and update the screen with that amount. And fill essentia is where we're actually doing the actual commands to send the message to the turtle. So what it does is it gets the um, a, a, a array called essentia data. And the first uh, piece of information in that array is the current type of essentia. So in this case, if we were filling up, um, you know, let's say air, we would say air. And then the second piece of information that's being sent is the amount that we're going to fill it. So let's say nine. Okay, and it uh, sends that data in a string called send data, and this text utilities serialize basically takes that array and turns it into one string because uh, the only information you can send from computer to turtle is a string. And then it sends it to the turtle ID, remember that's 40, that's the thing you're probably going to need to change, and it's going to send that data string. So it's just going to say, hey, I need 55 air. Then it's going to clear the screen, and it's going to print out on the screen, waiting for aspects to finish cooking. Don't forget to refresh the screen after the GOM is done moving the Essentia. Then it's going to sit there and wait for a RedNet message. So it's going to wait for the turtle to send it a message over RedNet saying complete. Remember, after it's done and the furnace is empty, it sends a complete message back. So we're not allowed to interact with the computer monitor until uh, the furnace has emptied out. Then it's going to clear the screen on the monitor and run that fill table command and the refresh command. And remember, fill table uh, basically uh, removes the you know, plus minus buttons. It brings back the refresh button. And then the refresh command checks all the essentia in all the jars. Now, at this point, the golem is probably still carrying some essentia back and forth. So you're probably going to want to hit refresh. This was a little decision I had to make. Do I like wait 20 seconds and have the computer locked up and say you can't interact with the computer for 20 seconds until I'm pretty sure the golem is finished moving? Or do I just, you know, let it finish and rely on the user to have to hit refresh? I could also have put in something where like it refreshes every five seconds, but that just seemed wasteful. So those are some of the options that I could have gone with. And that's basically how it works. So I think that covered pretty much everything. The cancel button's real clear. It just, you know, clears out the screen, uh, runs that fill table command and refresh again. So cancel does the same thing as execute, except it doesn't actually do the execute piece. Uh, so let's see it in action. I'm going to restart the computer, and it's going to refresh the screen, as you can see. So we've got all this stuff in here. So remember, when I hit refresh, it executes that refresh button, and it uh, knows that I clicked the button and runs the refresh command, and that really quickly just goes to all the uh, jars in the screen here and checks out what type of aspects they have and stores them all in that information, and refresh also prints the information to the computer monitor for us. All right, now when we click on any one of these lines, it knows which uh, line I clicked on by looking at that variable. So we click on mortise, for example, and we get a new thing. This is that fill table two that's running, and it's saying Essentia Mortis currently contains seven. And then there's that fill amount variable, currently adding zero. And then whenever I click this button, it adds the number to the current fill amount and then recreates the screen. And remember, it won't let me do any more than, um, you know, 64 minus the current amount, which is 57. So if I keep trying to add, it won't let me add anymore. You know, if I subtract one and then add five, it's still going to bump it up just to 57. That's the most it'll do. And then at the end, it'll also no lower than zero. And refill jar is just going to do 64 minus the current number, which is seven, which is 57. 
And then finally, let's say we wanted to put, I don't know, 22 in there. We hit execute fill request. Now it's going to send the message over to the turtle, which is going to know which inventory in the chest below it has those types of uh, beans in them, the mortise beans, for example. And it's going to start cooking them all up. Once the furnace is empty, it's going to let the monitor be activated again. And the turtle is going to carry around the mortise and just place it into its appropriate jar. And uh, what we want to do now is make sure that once the golem is complete moving through, we want to go ahead and hit the refresh button, which will refresh the screen for us. So over here we see mortise. So remember, uh, we had to wait for the golem to move, so that's why it still says there's only 8 in there. But once we hit refresh, we'll see that 8 becomes a 29. And it also turned yellow now because it's more than 20. So that's the code review on the two things here. Uh, now there's one minor problem, um, and that basically comes down to um, the following. So let's say that we had a jar that was completely empty, and this is something that I actually have to fix. Let's go with, I don't know, Tempest, all right? Um, let's see, can I empty you? If the jar is completely empty, this is a little bit bugged that we found recently, so we just emptied out Tempest. Watch what happens when I refresh the screen now. Remember, it builds the array based on all the aspects and all the jars. Refresh. Um, let's see what happens. This guy, Tempest, is zero, is one it says, but it should be zero. So basically it's not really good about understanding when there's nothing in there. And if we reboot the computer, when it refreshes, look, the Tempest isn't even there. So if it, you know, hasn't if the if the jar is empty when the computer first starts up, it won't even know about the Tempest. So that's just something we need to be aware of. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that back in. I'm probably gonna write some code and maybe I'll get you guys an updated paste bin that'll kind of handle that. I think what I'll have to do is just write into the code like every aspect that exists. I, you know, that's that's probably your best bet. Um, there's really, you know, no better way. We're just gonna have to list all the aspects in the code uh, ahead of time and that'll prevent it from, you know, having a problem like that. So for now, this is Darwell20 signing off. Hope you enjoyed the code review. Um, yeah, that's about it. All right, guys, take it easy.